So uh, grateful to be with you again this morning. My name is Tim. I'm the pastor of The Journey. And uh, just really honored that you um, have uh, set aside time this morning uh, to worship together uh, with us and to glorify God. Um, if you would like, the, uh, there's a sermon outline uh, that has some notes that go along with my message this morning. Uh, you can download those on our website. There should be a link on the Facebook feed that will take you to that. And uh, also can be a, a resource that you use in the coming week to help you reflect on and, and do some more study and work in really allowing God's Word to take root in your heart and the, and the truth of that Word. So I encourage you to do that, not just for this morning, but to use that throughout the week. We live, uh, I feel almost uh, ridiculous and redundant saying this because it's, it's so um, obvious, but we live in, in a world of hurt. We live in a world that is just filled with um, so much pain. And uh, some people have described uh, the, the time that we're leaving, living in as a, a loneliness epidemic that statistically that 40 to 60 percent of Americans, depending on, on which report you read, but 40 percent at the low end, 60 percent at the high end, report feeling lonely some or all of the time. People f are physically alone. More and more people uh, live by themselves without people around them, and then add to that the mix of, of a pandemic and and um, not being able to connect with people socially. People are relationally alone. Statistically, people have um, fewer friends now than they did even a decade ago, and even more so 20 years ago, that, that, our, that our circle of friends is shrinking, that our families of connection are shrinking, that even people who are with people don't feel like they're understood by the people that they're with, so that we can be lonely even in a crowd. That people are lonely. And it's not surprising that, that we might see that among seniors as, as they get older and are more isolated from communities and are uh, um, less able to go out, but, but even um, striking that we see that among young people, that younger generations also just ha have a profound sense of loneliness. And, and did you know that, that loneliness has the, uh, the health equivalent, the negative health impact of smoking 15 cigarettes a day? Right? So those of you who have tried to kick the habit and know how important that is to your health, like finding relationships, being connected to other people is even more important than kicking the habit. We live in a loneliness epidemic. Other people describe our time as a mental health crisis, that anxiety and depression and an addic and addiction are at all-time highs, and, and the, the the kind of striking thing, all these statistics that I'm talking about, all this information actually precedes 2020, precedes the pandemic, precedes the, the um, social um, unrest and, and the racial divisions that have come to surface again and, and the political tension and all the striving and all of this even before that. And then you add that into the mix and things have only escalated from, from there. Why is it? Why is it that so many people are suffering, experiencing these things? Is it because of social media and the, the, inf the impact that it's having in our culture and, and the unintended consequences of, of virtual relationships and, and um, all of the things that come along with that? Is it, is it because of the breakdown of the family and other institutions in our culture that people are being isolated and in isolation, suffering um, mental health issues? Is it because, as some people would say, that we've taken prayer out of public schools? Or is it because of the polarization of our society around political issues and, and the social issues of our day? Is it because of Donald Trump or Mitch McConnell or, or um, Nancy Pelosi or, or Chuck Schumer? Why is it that we are suffering these things? And even aside from the pandemic and the other things, why is life so hard? Why is there so much hurt? And to be sure, there are complex social issues that surround all of these things that, that defy a, sing, a single cause, and, and maybe it's even a disservice to them to try and reduce them to that on the societal level, but on, but on a personal level. You can come down to this and just say this simply, right? 
People are hurt. All of us have been hurt in the course of our lives. And the reality is that hurt people, they haven't dealt with their hurt, are people who hurt people. And when you live in a world of several billion people in a city of several million people, and all of them have been hurt, and all of them are hurting people, then it's inevitable that we're going to have a world of hurt. But what I want to emphasize more this morning is than why, because the whys, we can debate those all day, is what? What, if anything, can, can we do about it? No, no, no. I want to, not what can we do about it. What, if anything, can I do about it? And what, if anything, can you do about it? What can be done? If you've been following our story that we've been walking through over the last several weeks as we've kind of unpacked the world as it exists and, and where we are in the world, that we've basically, I, I can summarize it this way, we, we've kind of broken it down into four acts. In act one of the larger story that we live in, that there was creation, that God created the heavens and the earth, and as he created each element of it, he said that it was good, except for this one thing that after he created Adam, he says it was not good for man to be alone, and then he created out of Adam, he creates Eve, and it's very good, right? God has created humanity in his image and likeness, crowned with glory and honor, placed them in paradise. Act one of the story is a story of beauty. It's, it's the once upon a time of all once upon a times. But in act two, something t- goes terribly awry that sin enters the world, and with sin, shame and pain and blame and heartache and brokenness, and all manner of evil is unleashed in the world in the fall. Creation, fall. But then there's a great rescue that takes place when God becomes man in human flesh in the person of Christ to rescue us, to save his world, to redeem it, to take it back, to claim it. And not just the world, but those that he created, those he loves in the world, to restore us to a relationship with God. And so in Act 3, that there's this great rescue, and it's all leading up to a restoration, a renewal of all things in Act 4 of the story. And that right now, we're living somewhere toward the end of Act 3, right? After the redemption, after the, the rescue of Jesus, but still awaiting the final consummation of the kingdom. And in saying that we're in, in the, the end of chapter 3, I'm not saying that, hey, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus may be coming soon. Jesus said, be, be, stay alert, watch, wait, look for me, anticipate my coming, prepare for my coming. Don't go to sleep on it. It's coming. But do we wait for this renewal? And we're still waiting. And while we wait, then it's very clear that we still have a reason to be here in our waiting. Right? We're not just biding our time till Jesus comes back, that we have a reason. Just quickly, Psalm 139. The psalmist says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You are at this time, the psalmist says, because God ordained it to be so. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we've been saved by by grace through faith, not by works so that no one can, can boast, but to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That God had ordained these day, days for us, and that we, has a, we have a purpose in them. Acts chapter 17, 26, that God determined the times and set for us and the exact places where we would live. That we are where we are in time, we are where we are in history, we are where we are in geography, because God ordained it for us to be here. And my, my primary point this morning is not just that you have a reason for being here, but that you actually, and I actually, have something unique to offer in this day. I want to say that you have, are you ready for this? You have a superpower. 
You have a superpower. Now, I suspect some of, the, some of you might be thinking right now, while, wow, Tim, you have a super imagination, if you think that I have a super power. Or maybe you're thinking, you are super misguided. Or maybe you would take it even another, maybe you're just thinking, Tim, you are super stupid. Maybe you're inventorying your assets right now, and you're thinking, superpower, superpower. Do I have any power? What power do I have? What, what are my best? What is the best thing that I have to offer? Could, I, could it possibly, could that be something that's super? Is there something that I'm even good at? And I want to say, unless you've done a lot of work on the heart level, unless you've done a lot of work, you start looking for what I'm talking about in your superpower. It is probably not in your assets ledger. Right? If, you, if you have a ledger of your assets and your liabilities, I'm going to tell you that your superpower, unless you've done a lot of work, is probably not in your ledger of assets. And more likely, it is in your ledger of liabilities. In fact, I would contend it is the largest item among your liabilities. Maybe so large that you've already written it off in your life as bad debt. Right? Just something to be forgotten because it can never be reclaimed, never be recovered. The source of your superpower rests beneath your greatest vulnerability your greatest embarrassment or source of doubt or fear or shame. Beneath that thing that you are most regretful of, most want to make sure that nobody else ever finds out about, never gets discussed again, the thing that you would like to hide away and forget about to ever, like the, the, the skeleton in the closet that you hope will never be opened up. Because God says this. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. And the context in which he says this, he's actually having, it's, it's in um, Paul's writings to the letter at Cor in Corinth, that he speaks these words. And Paul was um, a man who had all the right credentials. Right? He was a guy that had the right DNA. He was um, Jewish born, and he was um, speaking to um, people that that meant a whole lot to, that he was among God's chosen people. He had the right DNA. He had the right credentials. He went to, to the right school to, with the, one of the leading um, scholars of his day. That He had the right education. He had the right citizenship. Even though he was Jewish was born, he was a Roman citizen. He had an incredible testimony of how God took him from darkness into light. He had ecstatic, just unbelievable visions and revelations of God in, in, in a paradise that, that God revealed to him. He had a long list of accomplishments in, in his missionary journeys and planting churches all over um, the Roman Empire. He had uncompromising determination. I mean, he went through all kinds of, of things in the course of his life and never let up in his pursuits. He, he, he went to prison, he was beaten, jailed, shipwrecked, all kinds of tragedies. And someone with all of that, someone with all of those credentials, someone who had gone through all of those things and prevailed, is someone who could start to believe with all of that that they actually were all of that. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, to keep me from becoming proud... I was given a thorn in my flesh that he describes as a messenger from Satan to tor torment me. To keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, 
a messenger from Satan to torment me, to keep me from becoming proud. I was given a humbling source of pain in my life. So much so that Paul says he pleaded with God to remove this thorn from his flesh, begged God to take it away from him, to relieve him of this agony. And he says each time that he asked God to remove this thorn, God responded, my grace is all you need. Paul, you don't need your list of credentials. You don't need your list of accomplishments. You don't need all those things that you hang your... You don't need your visions and revelations, right? What you need to know is that my grace is sufficient for you because my power works best, not where you're strong, Paul, not where you're accomplished. My power works best where you are weak. And Paul embraced it. Paul embraced the superpower of his weakness wholeheartedly. So he says, so he writes, so now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses, pleasure in my weaknesses, and the insults, hardships, persecutions, troubles that I suffer from Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In 1 Corinthians, he says, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message, my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. He says, if I must boast... I will boast of the things that show my weakness. If I'm going to tell you about anything, I'm going to tell you about how broken, how shameful my past is, how broken my life is, how weak I am, because in it you see God's strength. He says to his young protege, Timothy, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Timothy, I am the worst of them all. Right? This guy with all these credentials, all these accomplishments, all these achievements says, I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Timothy, if, Paul can, if God can save me, he can save anybody. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God and forever and forever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. There is unbelievable power in the unleashing of your superpower. The unleashing, the unveiling, the revealing of your weakness. The psalmist says in Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and whose spirit is in whose spirit there is no deceit. He says, when I kept silent, when I hid my weakness away, when I buried my shame, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged, then I let it out, then I opened it up. I acknowledged my sin to you. You did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Unleashing, unveiling, releasing your weakness, your embarrassment, your shame, your pain. So the psalmist says, freeze you. Freeze you from guilt. Freeze you from shame. Freeze you from all the masks and the poses that we wear to hide those things, that got, to hide those things away, to keep people from seeing them so that we can keep a good look, maintain a strong front. 
frees us up from the pain and the agony and the burden of carrying all that garbage so that we can be truly ourselves, so that you can be truly you. Not the front, not the pose, to be truly you. Because only when we are truly us and people know us for who we are, can we be truly loved? So you all have a certain idea of who I am. And, and I try and, like, give you my best front, right? And, and you think, hey, Tim, he's pretty cool. I like him. Or, Tim, he's really great. I love him. Or, or Tim, you know, he's a good guy. And I've got this whole bucket load of stuff that you don't know about me. And you say, Tim, you're great. And I say, yeah, but you don't really know. You don't, if you knew what's in the closet, you wouldn't think that about me. It's only when the closet's emptied out and you know who I truly am that I truly can be loved by you and know that you truly love me. To truly connect with other people. Right? We're freed when we get it all out on the table to truly connect with other people. It frees us up. Paul says, going on in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that God is our merciful Father, source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. That it, that it not only serves us, but it also, it not only frees us, it serves others. But when we come out of the shadows, that we invite other people out of the shadows to, breed, to be freed from the grip of guilt and suffocating shame. It's like when I'm honest, I give you permission to be honest. When I'm posing, then I'm posing on you the need to pose. That when we say, hey, this is my heartache, this is my pain, this is my shame. And you see God seeping through that, and you see how God has worked in my life and is bringing comfort to me, then I have something then out of that pain and brokenness to bring to you to offer comfort. That we can actually serve others, not with our strengths, but from our weaknesses. That we invite people to be truly them. And we allow people then to be truly loved. And Paul says that when this is unleashed, right, that when we bring our brokenness and our pain and our shame to God, when we open up, when we unlock our weaknesses, when people see that, and they see then God at work, not in our strengths, but in our brokenness and in our pain, that all honor and glory goes not to Tim because he's such a great guy and while he speaks really, right, all glory and honor go to God forever and ever. That it honors God because it reveals the power of God to save. It reveals the power of God to take the very worst of our lives and do something beautiful out of it. It is the application of, of God to our lives for salvation. Paul said, I'm not going to boast about any of my achievements, not any of my accomplishments. I will boast about the cross of Jesus Christ and what he's done for me and with me and through me and in me. It turns our shame that was lost in the fall back to reveal again God's glory. It then allows us to truly love God. Because what does God say? He said, Jesus was asked, what's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Love God with everything you've got. But that closet where we keep the skeletons, right, it's located in our hearts. 
And we close that closet to keep the skeletons tucked away. We close a part of our heart off from God, and we can't love God with our whole heart if we've got a door shut. We honor God by opening up that door and giving him access to liberate us and then to serve others out of it. What's at stake? Right? What's at stake if we drop the pose or maintain it? If we open up our lives and allow people to see what's truly us and allow God, people to see God at work in us. Literally, people's lives are at stake. Because when I talk about the world of hurt that we're living in, people are dying. And people are actually taking their own lives. In shame, in guilt, in loneliness, in pain. Taking their own. Some of them, more and more, all at once. Many more with a slow death that comes from the disease of loneliness and addiction and anxiety and depression and guilt and shame. And we have this power within us to unlock that. See, your assets, my assets, they, they might garner us applause or admiration or respect, maybe fame, maybe fortune. They might make people envious. Oh, I wish I could have that. I wish I was more like that. They might get us Facebook friends or make us Instagram influencers. But they are unrelenting taskmasters. Because we offer our strength, we do it once, and then we need to do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Because as soon as we let it down, then what do people see? We have to maintain the pose. We have to hold it up and keep. It's an unrelenting taskmaster. And it's an incomplete picture. I show you the part of me that looks good and that I want you to see and hide the rest away. Without love, Paul says, it's noisy, it's unfulfilling, and it's unprofitable because love is the stuff of relationships. And re relationships require knowing other people in truth, and being known by other people truly. Your weakness, my weakness, surrendered, unlocks the power of God in your life. Your weakness surrendered unlocks the power of God in the life of others. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, Your weakness surrendered. He says, I'm sorry. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. I, I've read that verse a hundred times. When I was growing up in high school and college, I always said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to tell people that I follow Jesus. I'm not ashamed to tell people that I'm a Christian. And I'm not sure that's what Paul was actually saying. I, I don't think Paul ever considered being ashamed of being a Christian. I mean, look at the life that he lived and all the things that he worked with, that he went through in the course of life. He never was ashamed of that. He says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel that tells you that, that, that I'm a train wreck. That, that my life was a mess, and that life, life is a mess, except for him by the grace of God and his power being made perfect in my weakness. I'm not ashamed to hide from you what I truly am. Because that is the gospel, that God takes 
not who we think we should be or not who we ought to be or, or not who we wish the, what, the world we want to, who we truly are. It's the gospel is that God is taking our weakness and using it to accomplish the fulfillment of his kingdom and to reveal his glory at work in our lives to the world. Knowing and being known is the key to loving and being loved in our relationship with God and our relationships with each other. It's why for our church, one of our highest values has always been and will continue to be connecting in authentic relationships in community. And we've been pushed away from that over these last several months, doing that in, a, in, in so many ways because of the pandemic. But as we enter into the fall, we are leaning hard back into that. And so in some ways, what we've been doing over the last few, several weeks is actually an infomercial of God's truth and God's purpose for your life for where we're leaning into as we go into the fall. We are relaunching our small groups, and we're actually we're going to do them live and in person, outdoors, socially distanced, following all the rules and requirements, but we're going to have live small groups. Um, there's going to be a link in your um, Facebook feed this morning that you can uh, connect with to fill out a form to sign up for a group. Um, I encourage you to do that. If you're not ready to do it, I encourage you to pray for it. We're going to come back to um, this next week, and we're going to be starting in a couple weeks. But this is all about what it means to be God's people in the world, where we are at this time and in this place for God's purpose. Lord, I pray that as we continue to walk with you together, we would walk in humility, confidence, and grace, not in who we are, but because of who you are. Because of what you've done in our lives, and because of what you're doing in our lives, and because, you want to, because of what you want to do in our lives. Give us courage to be real, to be authentic to take off the mask, to drop the pose, to allow people to see us in all of our brokenness, that they might see you in all of your glory. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So sign up 